Well, welcome to uh, City Life Unplugged today. If you're new with us, we're so thankful that you're here. Um, today is, is going to be a little bit different day. I'm not going to do a sermon as normal um, because I just want to share my heart a little bit with you. I know we have a lot of guests, first-time guests, people that have uh, found us online or come recently. We have a lot of people at home right now watching, and uh, it's been quite a time, 2020, right? I'm not going to talk about all the things. We know all the things. We know all the problems. We know everything. We miss right now. We miss having our kids. We're so thankful to have some of our kids. Can we give our kids a hand one more time? We love having them. At one point, this place was busting with kids, 100 kids uh, coming on a Sunday with three services, and God was uh, doing amazing thing within our family and everything, and he still is. It just looks different, and we know that. As, as I share a little bit of my heart today, I want to start by talking about the sermon series we're going into. We're going to be starting our prayer and fast tomorrow. We're going to have Zoom, and we'll send you the Zoom link. We're not just going to throw it online for anybody to, to join in. We don't want to be Zoom bombed and all that, but we're going to send it to you, to your uh, email account and all that, so you can join us on Zoom. That's probably the best way to collaborate, to pray, and uh, we'll be doing worship together. We'll be praying together. Every day we'll have uh, its own significance and something we're going through Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday. Friday night, we'll have registration because we are going to have worship here together and uh, worship and pray and kind of end our time, which we're really excited about. And we do this every year at City Life Church, as G said, joining with our church family all around the globe, over 80 countries that we get to pray with and we get to fast with. And you'll see videos of some of those pastors and people from all over the world as we kind of have a little 10 minute teaching every day. We'd love for you to join us. And let me say this, anybody that talks about vision casting, Maybe even given like a, like a TED Talk. How many of you guys ever watch TED Talks? Or if you're a Christian, the Christian version is Q Ideas. Um, whatever you use, anybody says when you share a vision, you always have to start with the problem. Simon Sinek, a thought leader and author, says you need to start with the why, not the how. And typically, you have a problem that you need to be able to solve, and then you need to give reasons for it, and then you need to give the timing of it, the goals, what this looks like, when we're doing what. Today, I don't have to share much about the problem. You see our world, and we see the problems. In fact, we're titling this sermon series we're going to be going over the next seven weeks together called Refresh. And the picture we got as, as, as I was praying and believing, what, God, what do you want to say in this new year? And how do we want to visualize it and help people understand where we're going and what we want to do? This idea of refresh, if any of you have a, have a Mac um, you have the spinning wheel of death, the rainbow wheel of death. If you've tried to do too much or you have too many tabs or your Mac is just dying, you'll have this rainbow wheel going. And you've experienced that, I'm sure, plenty as you've been at home, working from home, doing different things. If you don't have a Mac, we'll pray for you. So uh, we've experienced this. And the idea is that let's look at 2021 and pray and believe and let's refresh our screen. Let's refresh our life. Um, back in the day when I used to have a PC, we used to have to turn the whole thing off to refresh it, right? Delete the cache, do all these kind of things. And then all of a sudden it just magically works. It needed a break. It needed something new. And I want to talk about the vision that God has for us to refresh us. Hopefully to refresh you as a person and as we continue to talk about what this idea of refreshing our story, refreshing our life, refreshing our prayers and our opportunity and our boldness and our witness as we go through this series. Today is a little bit more, again, just we're in the living room. Dad's talking to the kids and extended family. We got to worship together on guitar and, and sing and we didn't have full band today like we normally do, but this is a time just to, let's talk. We've got plenty of problems in our culture. This is probably the craziest season of my life to be a pastor. I've been doing this 20 years, full-time ministry. Me and my wife celebrated 20 years of marriage, 20 years of full-time ministry, uh, uh, and 10 years here at City Life Church just this past year. 
And there's a lot of like monumental things that come with that, right? And, and, and it's made me think a lot, especially over the, the holidays and over Christmas time. We, me and my family got to go. We usually go to, to Oklahoma. And Casey's dad uh, has a kind of ranch, has about 100 acres, horses and cows. And it's like country dark there. Like you can actually see the stars. It's exciting. Uh, you can't see that here in Houston. And I am a city boy for sure. However, it's nice to get away. It's comforting sometimes just to kind of have some time alone, uh, have the kids kind of get away from some of the craziness of culture. And we took about a week over Christmas to do that. And the, the Lord was really speaking to me a lot. As I said, 20 years of full-time ministry and this past year has been just nuts. Every week, like planning a scripture in 2020 and a sermon was harder than ever. Why? Because as soon as I had a problem that we need to solve, all of a sudden there's some catastrophic event in our culture that that other problem was irrelevant. It's almost like today I was going to talk a lot about COVID and the issues that we're dealing with there and hopefully some hope with vaccinations, wherever you feel about that. But there's some idea of maybe we're going to have a resolve and get through and be able to refresh the page of health and our culture in this to get back to some normalcy. And yet then all of a sudden there's this invasion of the Capitol and it's like now COVID is, that's not really the problem right now. The problem is everything's nuts and it feels like every week there's a new problem to try to solve. And a lot of people today are wondering what's the point of church? What's the point of being a believer when everything seems to be just going downhill? Aren't we supposed to be doing something in culture and it almost feels like church, Christianity, religion is similar to what G said, prayer is passe, it's irrelevant, it's what are we doing? And, and, and I think it's a moment, though, for the church. I think it's a judgment, a warning, a recall, a refreshing of what does it mean to even be church? What does it mean and what issues are we solving? Because we see the problems and yet it doesn't seem like There's a lot of solutions right now. Or the solutions we're looking for is to escape in something else or to get back to where life was, but not necessarily Jesus, not necessarily the church. In fact, I've heard of people that have have great businesses and nonprofits and say, we do more. We are the church. Have you heard this a lot? We are the church. I am the church. And, And that is true to an extent in the same way If you're here and you're a citizen of America, you're an American. But there's limitations even to that. You don't encapsulate all of America in the same way we are the church. You are the church individually, but you don't encapsulate everything about church. The thinking about a lot of this, I said, being and doing church ministry for a long time. And the Lord has been asking me my why. Why do you? do what you do. See, because when you do lose that why and the problem, you feel like you've solved it with other things, you can start going into a place of consistency or complacency, apathy, frustration. Maybe you felt like that in your job or in your workplace or at school, if you're virtual or online or, or imagine, you know, those people Last year, seniors in high school that graduated and didn't get a proper graduation, and then they go to college, and it's just all of this frustration and problems. I think, though, it's an opportunity as well. Any times that there's opposition, there's opportunity. The idea of suffering or bad things that happen in our life, problems that come, is to amplify certain things in us, but it's God's amplification also to say, why are you doing what you're doing? What are you about? Are you being the person that I've called you to be or are you doing the thing you should be doing? And so you see a lot in our culture, people going, is this the job I wanna do? Is this the church I wanna go to? Is this, unfortunately, the family or the thing that I'm really after? 
the wake-up call of the mundane when everything is shaken and scripture in the book of Hebrews promises that everything, listen, your finances, the microphone, everything, it says, will be shaken so that only kingdom things remain. Only the thing that God has established will never be shaken. But God's not afraid to shake everything else under your feet so that you'll get to the why, you'll get to the purpose, you'll get to the real thing and the calling that God has on your life. For us, I think, and for the church, it's to get to what does it mean to be the church. As I've been asking the Lord and refreshing some things in my heart, I I think about when I first went to church. I think about when I first gave my life to the Lord, I was a junior in high school, 17 years old, and God rocked me so hard in the point of I was willing to give everything I didn't care. Like God got a hold of my heart, not just my actions and making me look really spiritual, but my heart to where I'm crying out to him as a junior in high school, 17. I recognize my sin. I recognize I needed a savior. I'm out in Apple Valley, California, involved in our youth group and literal revival comes. And I, we started seeing a couple hundred students a week coming to the Lord, crying out to God in California, let me say. It was a wild time, and that's when I got called into the ministry, had prophetic words over my life, started, went to Bible school and, and decided this is what I wanted to do because for me, this changed everything. This was transformative. I, I tried other things. I tried like all of us, girls or, or, or entertainment or whatever it was to fulfill the need that I had to make me happy and make me feel full of joy, and it all always less left me desperate for something else. It was never satisfying. And although I didn't try everything because I was 17, I got to the end of myself and recognized I needed something else. And it was that spark that made me want to go into ministry and help lead other people into that same love affair and transformational life and walk with a God that's not just calling me to heaven, but calling me to pray and bring heaven to earth. And isn't that what it means to be the church? As Jesus asked his disciples in Matthew chapter 16, who do people say that I am? He went around and they said, you're Elijah, you're, you're John the Baptist, you're these types of people because of the performance and the things that you're doing. And he says, yeah, but who do you say? You know me, you've been walking with me. We've been living together literally all over the, the, the known nation that they were at and all over different homes and places. You've seen me eat, you've seen me sweat, you've seen me preach. Who do you say that I am? And Peter raises up and says, you're the Christ, you're the Messiah, the one we've been waiting for, the one that's prophesied about. You're the one that's gonna bring salvation, he says. The son of the living, not the dead gods around, but the living God. And Jesus says, well done. And he renames them to Peter, the rock. And he says, upon that confession, listen, not upon Peter, the church is gonna be built, but upon the confession of Jesus being Lord, the church is established. Why? Because that confession takes me away from being Lord, takes any other lowercase gods or idols that have kept me idle in my spirit and knowing God ultimately, but it's this confession of faith that transforms me, that now I am saved. Yes, I'm gonna be with the Father. Yes, I'm going to heaven. But listen, I've been given certain responsibilities Abilities to be a solution to problems, starting with my own. Starting with the sin or the idols in my life that God starts to expose and extract, expose and deliver, expose throughout the rest of my life, throughout the rest of your life, if you don't grow weary. God starts solving the problem that I have when I've tried to fill that, that hole, that void with so many other things, he comes in and starts to work on me. And the beautiful thing is, I have my relationship with God. He starts to develop me in my gifts, 
and my calling just like he did you but not alone never alone when Jesus talks about the church when he's talking to the people and says you are salt and light he says y'all are salt and light it's never a one person so although yes I am a part of the church and I am somewhat the church I am not fully the encapsulation of the church I need you you need me I need your giftings I need your personality and the way you do things so differently than me that is so valuable because my way is not the only way I need the grace that you have to offer because I receive the grace that God has to offer. I need the love and the mutual care and the work together because even just to work on the problem that is me and the sin that is in me and the things that are in me, I can't do it alone. And God never called me to. I need people to come alongside and call me out and call me up. You know, when you're in relationship with people, and you have people that call you up to a higher place. That's not who you are. That's not what we do. It's not someone just getting on to you and judging you. It's calling you up. And the more people that call you up, you allow them also to call you out when they see things. And you and me are bad at doing this in the mirror. I mean, I tell my wife, we've been married 20 years. I'm twice the man you married, literally, because I was a lot skinnier than I can look in the mirror and flex and be like yeah but if I really want someone to speak it to my life I need an outside perspective someone that says you can be more you can do better I need to be coached I need to be trained I need to be rebuked sometimes in our culture today where we cancel anybody that doesn't believe what we believe or doesn't have the truth that we have we need the church more than ever Ever under the banner and grace and forgiveness and love of a God who also in his spirit calls us and convicts us and says, don't do this, but he doesn't just convict you to deal with your problems, but also to be convicted enough to start taking responsibility for other people's problems. Not full responsibility because I can't change an individual, but under the banner of Jesus and the calling of Jesus and the lordship of King Jesus, I can appeal to you and you can appeal to me to read my word. Why? Because we should just read the word. That's what we do. That's what read the Bible. No, it shapes the way you think, the way you act. It calls you into remembrance of what God has done and who he is because the world will slowly or quickly strip that away as you go about society and hear all of these other ideas, all of these other philosophies about who God is or what he is or what he is not. Getting in your scripture reminds you of the true nature and characteristics of God. As we say, the first sin of Eve eating an apple, Satan didn't come in and bring a stick and bash them over the head to convince them to eat the apple. He didn't bring a stick, he brought a story. Did God say, questioning the righteousness, the goodness of God, is he really about you? And culture constantly does that. If you don't go to your word, if you don't have people in your life that are also walking in accordance with God, shepherding you, helping you. Listen, you will falter now more than ever. And isn't that the job of the enemy? I think about the Great Commission as Jesus tells his disciples what the church is gonna be about, what it means to build a kingdom and be in the church. And he says this in Matthew 28, 18 through 20, he says, go. And in the Greek, it actually says, as you go. So as you go to work, as you're going about your duty, not just you have to go to another country or to another place. Maybe you do, maybe you'll be called to that, but it's actually, as you go about your life, make disciples. Of all ethnicities, nations, not just your own culture and the people that you can relate with or know, but everyone. This is a call of inclusivity. We're going to take this message in this kingdom to the world as you're going about your life. 
make disciples, baptize them, which means to not just put them in water, but to literally the word baptize means to immerse them, immerse them. It says in the father, the love of the father, the works and the lordship of Jesus. It says in the Holy Spirit, immerse them in what it means to love and know the Holy Spirit and the gifts and the fruit, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And he says, teach them, instruct them. You're always being taught something. CNN is teaching you something. Fox News is teaching you something. The voice is teaching you something. Everything is teaching you something. And Jesus says, I want you to teach them about me, about who I am, about my word. Don't, don't make them afraid of scripture. Teach it to them, help them understand it. At our church, we do not protect you from the scripture. We'll talk about any scripture. We'll talk about the why, we'll study it. We wanna know because listen, the depths of the scripture, it's so beautiful, but you have to approach it humbly like a foreigner in another world. That's why foreigners don't like Americans a lot of times because we go and we're like, where's McDonald's? Where's, you know, we like have all these demands instead of humbly going into their culture, asking questions, learning the language. When you go into your Bible, you have to go with that same humility. It's a different culture. It's a different language in some way. Help me understand it, Holy Spirit. I need people around me that I trust, not that are just celebrities, but I trust that live this stuff out. Not perfectly, no one's perfect, but I've seen their character and integrity in a local context as well. Not that you can't trust or listen to other things, please do. Get on the Bible project, do these awesome, but I also need people around me to help teach the things Jesus says, Matthew 28, that I've shared with you, that I've taught you. And he says this, and I'll be with you forever. Now, let me tell you what Jesus didn't say what the church is. I think a lot of times North American church can be this, go and make church services, teaching people to get in small groups, and to serve once or twice a week on a Sunday. And once a week, I will be with you till the end of the age. Church was never meant to be one time a week. It was never meant to use your abilities, your gifts, your passions, or even just your willingness once a week. This calling, this commission that Jesus sends his church on is every moment of every day, 24 seven. But see, one of the problems I see in culture and I know the enemy and what he does, he's not dumb. We have a real enemy. And it's not the person that's different from your political bent. It's not the person that looks different than you or just acts different than you. It's a real spiritual enemy that has a plan and has a way and a will himself. But he's not stupid. Listen, this enemy that the Bible calls the Satan or the accuser, the evil one, Jesus even calls him in the Lord's prayer. This enemy has successfully done work, but his end game is not to defeat God. He's not stupid. He doesn't, he doesn't actually think he can beat God. But you know what his end game is that he's doing pretty good at? Is to distract and delay the inevitable. Amen. The inevitable factor that Jesus is gonna come back one day and save us all. Maybe you've heard this in church or in culture because of all the problems that we see and that we know. I mean, do you know the murder rate in Houston went up? I've seen different stats everywhere from 42 to 53% just last year during COVID 2020 from 2019. Nuts. Students flunking, falling out of school, 
people dying. We know the problems. Social unrest, addiction, alcoholism, drug abuse, racism. We know the problems. And the enemy's job, listen, is not to just defeat God. He can't do it. But he wants to delay God from returning. I keep hearing people say, Jesus, just come back. Jesus, I mean, this is so crazy. There's so many problems. And Jesus is just going to have to return. Anybody? Yeah? But do you know what Scripture actually says? He says, Paul says in Romans, he says in the Gospels, he's not returning until the fullness, it says, of the Gentiles come into the kingdom. So, so here's what he's saying. Until the church gets on mission, goes for the calling and the commission in Matthew 28 that I told you to do, Listen, I'm not coming back, and the enemy knows this. So the enemy's job is not to defeat God, but to delay the inevitable of Jesus coming back. And Jesus has limited himself to coming back, the Father said, until everyone I've called has come in. And so imagine a thousand years from now, if the church doesn't get its act together, that being you and me, all of us corporately, in doing the Great Commission and going out and sacrificing our very lives. Listen, we are delaying the coming of Jesus. That doesn't mean everything's going to be perfect and beautiful when Jesus comes. We do see pestilence, all the problems that he says. But he says, I'm waiting for the perfect time and I need you to be on mission because you're actually delaying me from coming. Paul would say it this way. We hasten the coming of the Lord in our work. This is why the first church was so passionate about changing culture and going out and evangelizing and sharing this message and discipleship because they knew Jesus was coming back and they wanted to expedite his coming back. They wanted it to be quicker and faster for the king to return because we are advancing his kingdom. And if we continue the church, I'm not just talking about Sunday morning, I'm talking about collective. If we don't get back to the calling and refresh our purpose and our why of who we are, I'm talking to Christians, I'm talking to myself, what it means to make disciples, to teach, to be immersed in God. Listen, we are only delaying the inevitable and the enemy loves it. So he'll distract us. He'll pull us off or he'll create church, discipleship, God, spirituality, something totally different. And we see it in our culture today. Our passion this year in 2021 is one word. We're, our staff sets our goals. We're talking about what this looks like, and it's the word empower. If you know anything about our church, our mission statement, our what, what are we called to do? What's our mission? We say is to honor God first, not honor ourselves, not create a celebrity culture, honor God. He's number one. And we do this by establishing Christ-centered. We want him the center of your life. Not just the priority and then you move on, but everything else revolves around the center, Christ-centered, spirit-empowered, socially responsible churches and campus ministries in every nation. The beautiful thing is being in Houston, we have almost every nation represented in Houston, which brings me back to why I'm a pastor, why I love the church and why I even came here to help replan and start this church and see the beautiful people and the members that we have. Not just to hold good church services or bad church services, whatever you think, but to be the church and the church that gathers, yes, because we have to gather for the word, for worship, for prayer, for mission, what are we going to do? Where are we going? But every day to do what God's called us to do. For me and for us this year, we do this not just with our mission, but how do we go about this mission? We, and we use these four E's. We said we've got to engage the culture, engage the lost, 
It's not good enough to say, everybody, sorry if you're not a part of us. No, we want to go into the world, as Jesus said, as he came to the world as well. We engage. But then once we engage people, if they come to know Christ, we've got to establish them in foundation. So we have a foundations class. We have a thing called a purple book that we implore you to go through, to take it. We say, have you done the purple book challenge? We want to encourage you to do that because you need to establish some kind of foundation that will not be shaken when everything else is shaken. And we say it this way, storms will come. God doesn't guarantee a storm-free life, but he does give you a storm-proof life. That's why we establish foundations. And then we want to equip you, give you tools, understand how to reach people. So we do like trainings on how to share your faith and what does faith look like. We do these different things and then finally empower you. We want to empower the individual and collectively the church to do the things that God has called you to do. You are the church. But y'all are, all of us collectively working together to expedite, to hasten the coming of Jesus for the full newness of a new earth and a new heaven. So this is what it means to be church. Next week, come back as we're going to we're going to talk about this. We're going to be going through the book of Acts and looking at the first church and refreshing. What does this look like? What are we missing? What do we need to add? What do we possibly need to subtract personally, corporately? Where are we going as a church? And I'm going to give you next week, I don't have time today, but five C's of what a church is. In concluding today, I want to ask you, what is your why? You're here for a reason. You're watching online for a reason. There's a million other things you could do. What does it mean for you to be the church, biblically? What is your role? What is your part to play? And maybe going into this fast, some of that is, Lord, refresh this in me. Maybe you've been so distracted with so many other things that you haven't adopted or really acknowledged or even planned. What does this great commission look like? Because I am church if you're a believer in here maybe you're not a believer watching online or here and you're going I, I don't know I don't know if I even believe in any of this stuff but I know something's missing maybe you were like me before Christ tried all these things to fulfill and we create these idols in our life it's anything that we adore or give allegiance to more than God and they've come to the end and you know it and you don't just try God we submit to God God I need a savior and I trust in you to be that savior that's the very beginning of being the church as well becoming into the family of God where you first are brought in and then you learn to believe more and more and then you become just like him where are you what is God refreshing in you and, and yes physically mentally all of it but also spiritually is he refreshing something in this season as you're seeing the problems and going I know Jesus has more that's my prayer Part of my prayer for this next week in fasting is just repentance and crying out to God to move as the problems have become a great megaphone for us to see the end of our solution and to see God as the ultimate redeemer. And then the prayer of how do you want to use me? How do you want to use our church? How do you want to change our city, our neighborhood, my family? As we submit to King Jesus. That's the goal. That's what it means to be the church. I want to encourage you. Ask yourself the why questions. Don't just walk away today, okay, but what is God speaking to me? What is he refreshing in my life? Because he wants to bring times of refreshing. Let's pray. Father, we love you, God. We thank you. for the opportunity that we get to worship you. And I thank you that you 
don't just do all the work, but you have called us co-laborers unto you, God. You have given us skills and gifts and passions and put your spirit into us. And your word says you sit at the right hand of God until your enemies have been made your footstool. Lord, let us take on the authority that you've given us with the confession of our faith, with the community of believers. God, to offer a hope and a life that is transformational. To offer the message of a God that loves and brings in and calls up and calls out each person in this room to number one, be with him and then learn how to do the things that he's called each of us to do. Lord, let us be the church. We love you. We need you. We praise you. In Jesus, amen. We're gonna end with a song, Jesus at the center. And as we're singing, we wanna offer, if, you're, if you feel comfortable and safe, we have a little communion at your seat. We wanna take communion with us. This is always the time to reflect and think about who Jesus is and what he's done. As the bread is broken, we think of his body that was broken, the blood shed for our salvation and showing the love of bringing us to God and welcoming us into his church. Let's worship together and take communion.